It was to hear that the young William Shakespeare would take a walk on an autumn evening to seek the hand of Anne Hathaway. And now around half a million visitors come here every year. Well, Stratford-upon-Avon is one of many tourist attractions which this stage will pass through today. Now, we all know that classic line from The Merchant of Venice, the quality of mercy is not strained. Well, mercy obviously didn't enter into the mind of those who planned today's stage. It's 151 miles, the toughest to date. It includes two Category 1 climbs, three Category 2 climbs. Now, obviously, the riders will have little time to enjoy the beauty spots which it passes through, like Cheddar Gorge and Bath. And we reckon, too, Phil, that this is the day when the midsummer night dream of many of the riders will, in fact, end. Well, thank you very much, Paul. Well, here we are, back in the start here in Birmingham. <laughs> and it looks like wheel trouble already there for the world champion, Stephen Roach, as they roll away. And the last man onto his bicycle here, Jan Erik Ostergaard from the Isoglass team. Over the flyover. This, uh, I understand, was the very first flyover ever built in Britain as we make our way out of Birmingham. Sean Kelly in early trouble. No need to hurry just yet because despite the 151 miles today, a gentle meander of 10 miles first. And that, by the way, makes the day 161, of course, but the time only taken when this uh, flag is pulled in and it is now the official start of the day. And it seems while the Tour of Britain goes one way, there is a different type of tour going the other way today with the steam locomotives heading to a rally. Steve Jones, the first rider to attack, and Jones is a local boy here from just outside of Birmingham, and this is causing reaction from Sean Yates. And Yates has been a strong man this week, and they've wiped up Steve Jones here, a little bit of a split forming. And this is the sprint in Henley and Arden, the TV time sprint. Malcolm Elliott taking three seconds bonus here, beating Wegmuller, and in fact that is wrong because Elliott was given the victory Vekmuller was in second place. The main field going by, not too far behind. And it looks now a little bit of sadness here because behind the field, the British champion Steve Jockin, with injuries uh, which occurred a couple of days ago, is calling it a day. And that is sad because Jockin, in fact, that when he came to Birmingham last year in the Kellogg's Tour, was the stage winner. Now down to Stratford. And the field still uh, keeping itself together. The odd flurry of attacks coming and going, but nobody breaking away. Elliott's got himself three very valuable seconds at that first sprint. This is the second TV time sprint. And we've got in the centre of the picture in the yellow there, Walsham dropping away. But coming now in the white jersey and challenging him, in fact, is Mark Walsham. Nick Barnes in white. The TV Times leader is on top. Walsham second and Steve Jones was third there, so that's very, very good news indeed for Barnes. And now we've got a mechanical problem here at the back, and it looks as though Stephen Roach is still making phone calls in this race, the second time in three days. Happy days, phoning home. And now we look down from our helicopter here over one of the most beautiful villages in England, in the Cotswolds, the village of Broadway. But any racing cyclist knows the blue flag here indicates the very steep climb away from Broadway, Paul, is Fish Hill. Yes, and this is our first real big counting event, counting climb today for the King of the Mountains. You can see the two contenders on the front there, Chris Lillywhite and uh, Gionetti from the La Suisse Wyman team. So it's a twisting climb, it's quite steep. We've got there in the centre of the picture, in the half-colours, uh, Chris Lillywhite, who was in the early attacks on this climb. This looks like Keith Reynolds, in fact, attacking very, very strongly, pulling away from the main field here. Lillywhite reacts very, very well indeed. Lillywhite takes over, and Stephen Hodge in the yellow almost fallen off there, but Hodge comes through on Lillywhite. Lillywhite still having a lot of fight in the mountains, despite the fact now he has really no hope of pulling off the overall championship. Here's the result of the first climb. Lily White wins it. Hodge is second, and Keith Reynolds, a very good third place. And in the top three there, notably, wasn't the uh, climbing leader, Gianetti. And there's a good vantage point for some here as they look out at the Kellogg's tour. Steve Sefton coming now into Cheltenham. Mark Walsham, narrowly beaten in the one at Stratford is in the lead of uh, those two Bilton riders being led out here well by his Bilton teammates. Uh, but watch this because this is the white jersey of the leader, Nick Barnes. He said this morning he feels he's as quick as Walsham in the sprint finish. Well, let's see 
Walsham's chasing him down here now as Barnes goes for the sprint. Walsham's into his slipstream. That's good for Mark Walsham. Walsham really is the fast sprinter. And Walsham comes over Nick Barnes. So this is a great competition now. Walsham gets it this time from Barnes. That's a 1-2 each way round so far today. This one's for Walsham. Barnes and Sean Yates there gets a one-second bonus. That competition, you know, is going to have a great finale in Westminster tomorrow. Sean Yates at the feeding station. It looks as though he doesn't know what to do with it, Paul. Well, actually, what's happened here is, uh, as Sean's gone through, he's making sure that he uh, he takes up the bag and he takes it really rather than take it by the strap because they're very fragile. He's actually taking it by the bag itself so as not to lose their food on a, on a long day like this. It's vital not to lose the food bag. Whole field together then, out of the feeding station now. There are, in fact, two feeding stations today because the race is such a long one. And now notice the incline of the trees in the distance there. This is Birdlip, a vicious climb away from Gloucestershire, the first category climb of the day. Joey McLaughlin, I would have thought, might want an attack here. Well, Phil, this is a climb that in the past has been used for many in many races to launch an, an attack for, uh, for winning breakaways. Stephen Hodge uh, leading Malcolm Elliott, Joey McLaughlin. We've had reports all day that there is an enormous crowd towards the top of this climb, by the way. It's a very narrow climb under the best of conditions. Frederick Vichot leading up on the group here. And Stephen Hodge, uh, quite a climber this week in second place, the Australian teammate of Sean Kelly in the Cass Sport Life team. Lily White also on the left of our picture, that familiar style when he's out of the saddle, swinging around on the bicycle. Also in the green there, Joey McLaughlin, and somebody beginning to move up too on the outside of the bunch here, trying to get up with the leaders. Slipped up a gear, continues the attack. This is an attack then going. As one of the Zeb Peugeot riders puts in an attack in the trees, it looks like Henri Abadie, twice a winner of the King of the Mountains title this year in two of Europe's major races. And now Aberdeen is trying to go clear, and they seem to have let him go at the moment. Quite frankly, I'm not too sure they could do anything about it. Robert Miller at the front now to try and whip up the field here behind. And Giannetti on the far side in that white jersey, the leader of the King of the Mountains. Noticeably, though, we haven't seen too much of Sean Kelly today, and I really felt that Kelly was putting in a bid for this title. Giannetti, uh, if he can gather some points on this climb, will be making safe that King of the Mountains competition because that ends today. There's no hills tomorrow in the city of London. Well, Phil, as you notice here, uh, Malcolm Elliott is very, keeping a very close eye on Joey McLaughlin because today's the day that Joey's going to try and surprise Malcolm and there he's already marking his man. Well, McLaughlin really has got to get rid of Elliott uh, if he is going to win this Kellogg's Tour and Elliott making sure McLaughlin doesn't get an inch. Still a little bit higher up the climb now. In the far distance over his shoulder is Gloucester. And Aberdeen, little look over his shoulder too. And the progress is slow but sweet as he makes his way up towards the summit of Birdlip, where we understand this marvellous crowd is awaiting. He's been quite a revelation this year, Aberdeen. Uh, nobody really had heard of him until this year. He had a very good Tour de France. And now we've seen him in the action every day uh, this week in the Kellogg's Tour. He's suffering now, though, as he tries to keep the rhythm high. Style of a climber, and it's working. He's going clear, and we're obviously getting near the summit because the crowd line now is beginning to filter past this man, Henri Abadie. Into the shade of the trees. Well, Paul, this is looking good. Well, this is a good move by Aberdeen. This is the same kind of move that he did in the Tour de France on the third stage when he went clear and took a long time of... Uh, a long, a long, uh, he was away for a long time and he earned himself the, uh, the Mountains jersey for quite some days. Well, here are the crowds in Britain. He could be climbing a stage now in the Tour de France. Let's just enjoy the atmosphere for a moment. Well, you saw those pictures, and I'm sure Aberdeen will have a memory of that because a lot of people in France, especially the racing cyclists, believe that cycling has no following in Britain. Oh, -ho. 
Well, over the top then, Abadi gets maximum points. He's no real challenger, though, to this man, Gianetti in the King of the Mountains, and Gianetti now is riding well to try and score maximum points that's left behind because his only rival here is Kelly. Kelly, as you can see, not scoring there on Birdlip. It's Abadi who gets the points. Gianetti now will be feeling a little bit safe in that competition. Now we're back with the leader. There's no real descent of Birdlip Hill. It climbs to a plateau, and that's a very difficult type of climb because the riders can't get going to bring the leader back. Aberdeen has settled in now, and I'm just wondering whether, Paul, this is a good move by McLaughlin to get a man away who is quite dangerous, don't forget. Only a minute behind overall, and if he gets far enough, then the Fago team are going to have to chase, and that'll help McLaughlin. Well, that's exactly what they've done. As you can see, the gap is going away very quickly already. What they've done is uh, to send away Aberdeen, who's well-placed overall, with the hope of uh, forcing the other teams to chase him down, harden the race up a little bit, so later on, Joy McLaughlin, when we get to some of the later climbs, can try and surprise Malcolm Elliott. Well, we're racing ahead here to cross the gap, and it looks to me now as though it's getting over half a minute. The team cars are in, and uh, the referee's alongside. It's hard to break the habits of a lifetime, and here's the Frenchman riding on his own side of the road, thanks to the courtesy of the police forces of England and Wales. There we had a little bit of a confirmation of the gap, 26 seconds. It's a bit of work to be done yet, but uh, let's not forget that this man is just over a minute behind the leader, Elliot, in 15th place overall in this race. And now as we climb the second category hill here of Rodborough, this is uh, a short climb, but you know, I think every bit as hard, if not harder, in fact, than the climb of Birdlip, which was given a first category rating. Judging by the face of this man, it's hurting a little bit as well. Very intelligent move, this, by the Zed Peugeot team. Everybody's watching McLaughlin try and take a man from lower down the classification, send him away early, and see what he can do. And right now, he's doing it very, very well indeed. Well, all eyes will be on Joe McLaughlin because he is the highest placed of the Zed Peugeot team overall. And the idea is to leapfrog people up the uh, general classification. So that's what they've done with uh, Henri Abadie today on what is expected to be the hardest day of the Tour of Britain, the day when everybody's going to try and take that last, uh, the last crack at taking the jersey off Malcolm Elliott. Well, at the back of the group here, looks to me like Serge Demir, who won the stage uh, the other day into Liverpool, was in trouble there on the climb. But, of course, his stage victory this week in the bag, and he won't be too worried about that today. He'll finish somewhere in the main field, that's for sure. By the way, we lost two riders this morning who didn't start the race. We've already had news that three have given up, so it looks like a day that one or two are going to drop out. Five gone so far today, and so that's bringing the field down to 66 at the moment from the original uh, 80 who started. Well, the Cotswolds are looking very tough today, Paul, and the weather itself is not very friendly either. We're going through quite heavy rainstorms, and it is not uh, at all pleasant for what should be, but in the countryside, one of the nicest days. This is the group here with Stephen Roach now being left to make the work here to bring back Aberdeen. He knows the danger. He's in charge of Elliot's destiny right now, so he's riding for the Fagor team. And, of course, McLaughlin playing the teammate now in second place. Well, Joey McLaughlin up there in second place. He's not doing any work at all, and he's forcing the Fago team to do all the work with the hope that they'll tie themselves out a little bit so that uh, he can go over the top. And I think they're just pulling up, pulling back here on uh, Gianetti, who went away to, climb the, to get the maximum uh, climbers points again. So Gianetti thinking of one thing, Aberdeen thinking of another. Gianetti, in fact, now on the climb of Rodborough. While further up, we have the man that's causing all of the trouble. He's going over the top of this Prem Hill. That's what they call it, with the white line and the white flag on the top. He is working very hard. That's a face full of determination here. He's not just out for the odd mountain point. He is out to stay out in front as long as possible, and if possible, all the way to the finish today. And Gianetti still finding the strength here to go well. He's made sure that today he came out fit and fighting on the early climbs. Over the top then. Some idea of the height as we look across the fields there of the Cotswolds. One of my favourite parts of Great Britain, this, the Cotswolds, with its wonderful villages, its very short climbs, and for the touring cyclist, an absolute paradise. I'm not so sure about the racing cyclist, though. 
Aberdeen keeping his rhythm nice and high. His lead is creeping up all the time, but they are taking this attack very seriously, and the Fago boys are keeping him pegged. He is not pulling away very quickly. Over the week, we've seen attacks go up and up and up to as much as 10 and 11 minutes. That most certainly isn't happening here. On the top of Rodborough, then we've got Giannetti going over in second place. That's putting him in a very strong position now. Hodge gets the third spot over the climb, and it's looking good now for Giannetti for that King of the Mountains title. Well, it's, it's definitely very good for Giannetti to pick up the points there because looking back down the line there, I can't see Chris Lillywhite getting any points at all. And look at this, it's hard work for Aberdeen. It's only creeping up, but it's now 37 seconds. It really isn't going anywhere at all. He's using a lot of energy to keep away from these riders. And this is Sean Yates here on the back of the chasing group. The main field continually now breaking up as we head on to Tippett's Hill. Well, um, as we look back there, as Aberdeen still in the front, keeping really, he's really suffering if you look at his face here, but all he's thinking about is keeping, uh, keeping away so that hopefully the move will break up behind. And last time we saw that group, it looked as if there were only 20 riders in it. And uh, Sean Yates was uh, suffering a little bit at the back, so Malcolm Elev is starting to become a little bit isolated, which is exactly what Joey McLaughlin and the Zed Persia team want. Well, it had to be today. What's up to Sean Kelly? He's pulled off the road there, called up his cast team. Kelly off his bike here on the climb, and most of the field will have seen him do that. So it looks as though he's getting a very quick change at the back of the race there. Possibly a puncture. The field know he's dropped down, and so they're going to put the pressure on even more now. This isn't going to help Aberdeen at all because he will not be aware of what's happening back there at the moment, at least. He's just trying to gain as whatever time he can. So over the top then of Tippett's Hill today, another steep climb in the bag. He's really doing well in the mountains. And uh, again, Paul, it's Giannetti. He's having an early start today and scoring well. Well, he's, uh, he's gone for a long one again. He's uh, pulling up all the points because as Aberdeen's been away, he's finished second on two, uh, two occasions. Aberdeen's too far down to be important. As we come up to the next one, he just accelerates a little bit away from uh, Stephen Hodge there, I think it was, to get uh, the maximum points again. So it looks as if he's uh, taking a serious option on winning this competition overall. Indeed, he is, Paul, and I think he deserves it. He had a good challenge from Lily White early on, and more recently, the late challenge by Sean Kelly. But today, he really has come out fighting, and now he goes over the top of Tippett's Hill, his third and second place on the mountains today, all behind Aberdeen. There's confirmation, and Pensek is the rider in third spot. Well, Aberdeen now is lead going up all the time to 44 seconds. The next big town is Bath, and can he be in the lead? Join us soon. As we welcome you back to day five of the Tour of Britain. We're 120 miles into this punishing 151-mile stage. The name Cheddar is thought to come from two Celtic words, Ched meaning height and Dwa meaning water. Well, water we've certainly seen in abundance so far. But one man who seems quite happy in the torrential rain is Mauro Gianetti. For the moment, he seems to have shaken off the threat of Sean Kelly to that title, King of the Mountains. Well, how will Gianetti get on through the gorge? It's two miles of winding road, taking him up to a height of 1,300 feet. A Category 1 climb, and thereafter, there's two further Category 3 climbs. The riders, still a few miles to come yet to this gorge. Let's go back now to Phil Liggett. Well, Paul certainly gets around. This is the leader, though, who will soon be at the Cheddar Gorge, but at the moment, he's still out heading for the city of Bath. Henry Aberdee, who broke away on the climb of Birdlip, is now searching and has nearly got it. He wants one minute, three seconds, in fact, to lead this race in yellow. Malcolm Elliott now and his Fagor team have to put in all of the effort. So this is a great move by Joey McLaughlin's uh, Z Peugeot team, Paul. Yes, but uh, the pressure really is on the Fago team as we go back up to the front and look at that for what the lead is now, 1 minute 57, and Aberdeen's well into that yellow jersey. It's really firmly on his shoulders at the moment. Well, it means now that for the first time uh, since this race began that we have a new leader, but only on the road, of course. There's still time for Malcolm Elliott's team to repair the damage. Aberdeen then into Bath with a lead of approaching two minutes. And it looks to me as though he is, in fact, now beginning to suffer. Breaking away at the 53 miles point today, by the way. 
and it's a long, long way. He's planning on a 98-mile uh, breakaway if he's going to stay away to the finish. This is the chasing group then working hard at the sprint finish in the city of Bath. There's the confirmation of the TV time sprint. Nick Barnes, the sprint leader, taking that second place overall. And it looks as though Aberdeen is beginning to suffer now, or the reaction is rather rapid from the field. A minute 29, uh, the gap now. Indeed, still in yellow, is one minute three seconds, was his deficit this morning uh, since he left the beginning. And through the Roman city here now, as they thread the way across the Cotswolds, heading out towards the Mendips. The rain, by the way, has been coming down uh, very, very heavily indeed. The final feed station here, Roger Leger, the manager of Aberdeen, passing up the food for the last 50 miles or so to the finish. A long way to go, Paul. Well, on the stage, as long as this, it's very important to get the uh, the bags. As, as the leads come down now, as we're talking, Phil, to 105, he's still got the yellow jersey, but only by two seconds. Yes, it might well be, Paul. He never really intended to get a lead uh, of uh, personal importance. It's more to make the other riders from the Fago team uh, chase him and hopefully that, that uh, they'll all come together, giving McLaughlin the springboard. Just look at these crowds here as we now race through Wells. Anybody that knows the cathedral here will also know the, the swans that live there too and even toll the bell. And now we are leaving Wells onto the Cheddar Gorge, this beautiful climb. It starts very, very steeply indeed. He's holding on now because for the last few miles he's preserved all of his lead at one minute and five seconds. He's doing a marvellous job here for McLaughlin. He's giving him the springboard he should make use of on this climb, you know as he now begins to suffer on the first category climb of the Cheddar Gorge. This is the last serious climb before Bristol will loom over the horizon. There is the main field, what's left of it today. Some 36 riders have formed to chase down, hopefully for them, uh, Henri Abadie. Yes, and as you can see, the, uh, the, the group just going through the gorge there. It's been a fantastic move by the Z Peugeot team as we go back to Aberdeen, who's uh, visibly suffering a little bit now. He's starting to rock his shoulders, but he's been out here for a long time. If he can get over the top of this climb of the Cheddar Gorge with uh, a good 30 seconds lead, he can go down the descent, which is very, very dangerous, and maybe stay in front up to Bristol. Well, maths was never my strong point, Paul, but I make it about 66 miles in the lead. Uh, for Aberdeen at the moment, and he's never really got out of sight of this pack, you know. I mean, just on two minutes is nothing. That's how serious this pack has taken the attack by Aberdeen. Nobody was going to uh, slip too far away from them. I'm so amazed, though, that this group has stayed together. These 13 riders seem to be proving totally inseparate, inseparable, rather, as they go up the climb here. They're watching each other's every move. Aberdeen now feeling all the pain of the Tour of Britain. Well, as Sean Yates likes to describe the, uh, the, the, the expression on this rider's face at the moment, he's got a full mask on. He's got the mask of pain as he's struggling to get up to the top of this climb as we go back to the bunch. And you can see it's the Fagor team all the time keeping the pressure on. And there you've got Malcolm Elliott with Joy McLaughlin close in attendance, waiting for his moment to pounce if he can over the top of this climb. Britain's own version there, the Angel of the Mountains, Robert Miller, setting the pace for the Fagor team. This little man who has so much power in his legs when the roads go steeply uphill. And our helicopter getting the best view, as always, as he looks down on another wonderful crowd that is following us around the country here all week. Marvellous crowds turning out, and we know you're enjoying the show because you keep on telling us, and we all appreciate that. Well, Aberdeen then on the climb. He is really now suffering quite considerably. News reaching us all the time that the lead is now beginning to tumble down rather rapidly. The last uh, time check we've got, which wasn't long before this corner, was in fact just a shade over 30 seconds. So you see the attacks here now by the Fagor boys and by the PMS riders. That looks like Mike Doyle at the front here on the left of the picture. They too are trying to chase down the leader. No friends uh, then for Aberdeen. He's now learning the full lonely life of being a professional bike rider on the Cheddar Gorge. Well, as he comes up here, it's still the Fagor team uh, with in close attendance, Joey McLaughlin, watching, waiting for the time, because this is the springboard to try and surprise Malcolm Elliott, because Malcolm is a slightly, not quite as good as uh, Joey on the climbs, and it's Joey's best place to try and attack him if he's going to. Plenty of cheers from rather damp holidaymakers on this climb. 
I don't mind the riders getting wet, but I do feel sorry for somebody on holiday as they stand on the side of the Cheddar Gorge, this most beautiful part of Britain in the rain. This is Malcolm Elliott now then. It's unusual to see Elliott on the attack on the climb, but he's proving this week that he is very, very strong on these climbs. And again, McLaughlin now coming up on his shoulder, Paul. Well, these are the two most important men for us at the moment. There, Joey is, in fact, uh, having the pace dictated to him by Malcolm. As they've always, as people, as the best rule in the book is the best form of defence is attack, and that's exactly what Malcolm's doing. He's dominating his own pace to Joey. Joey's trying to keep up, keep up through the inside, but there's such a such a large crowd up here that he's having trouble staying there. I would have thought, Paul, that this is proving to us that Joey hasn't quite got the edge here on Elliot because really, with Aberdeen now coming rapidly back to this group, if I'd have been Joey as, as the Aberdeen was caught, I would try to put in the attack because obviously that's the time to go. No more hills left. Well, it's got to be, if Joey's going to launch the attack, it's got to be before the top of this climb because afterwards we've got a very dangerous descent and then the run into Bristol. I would think, though, that Malcolm Lewis is looking very, very confident here. He's got Sean Yates, who's done an incredible ride today, and he's probably the rider who's ridden the most on the front of this Tour of, Tour of Britain this year. Absolutely right. I thought you almost said the Tour de France there, but that was last month, Paul. It must be Britain this week. Aberdeen then, being caught all the time, but he's done everything possible here to give Joey McLaughlin his chance, and I know that McLaughlin will appreciate that. The strong man Yates now, the whole of the Fager boys, as this uh, climb comes towards its end, they must be feeling now full of confidence. Well, obviously, Phil, if you look, in fact, if you, I can actually see the difference in the speed here as Sean Yates is motoring up this climb. There's a visible difference in the speed of the two groups. Aberdeen's been away for some 40, 50 miles now. He's beginning to, to weaken with Sean Yates putting the turbo into action, dragging Robert Miller and Malcolm Elliott there in third place. This is the, te the Fagor team, the team that we've seen at the front of the Tour of Britain almost since the first day. Yes, you've got to vote them the most outstanding players of the match, as it were, because uh, Sean Yates has done a sterling job with Miller and, of course, Stephen Roach, and not to mention Malcolm Elliott. But this rider's done the sterling work today, in the lead now for approaching 70 miles. He's tried to win this race the hard way, and for a while he was the overall race leader on the road. And the only reason he isn't now is because the Fagor team have put in the effort required of them to bring him back. He took them on, and they've responded. They're catching now all the time. The last time uh, time check we have is 20 seconds now to Aberdeen. So all the way up this climb, they are bringing him back. We're over the steep slopes of the Cheddar Gorge now, but this climb goes on for some way yet. Well, Aberdeen starting to uh, starting to get to the easier part of the climb, and if he can get over the top, 20 seconds clear, that's all he needs, he stands a better chance on the descent. Yates is continuing here to set a tempo that no one else can follow. Robert Miller, content to ride in his slipstream. He's had the most marvellous season this year, Sean Yates, winning stages in all of the world's major races. Well, to come back to the tactical point of view as we go back to Aberdeen here, uh, the, the, the best tactic that the Fago team can attack, to, can adopt now, is before they were chasing to try and pull Aberdeen back because he was a threat. But now that he's only 20 seconds in front, they will change the tactic slightly and keep the speed high enough, which is exactly what Sean Yates is doing, to prevent Joy McLaughlin from attacking. Well, if you've got the legs, it's all right, I suppose, Paul, but if you're suffering at the back of that bunch, as I know one or two riders are, because one man who has been detached at the back are the, is a teammate of uh, Sean Yates and the Fago boys, and that's Bernard Richard, the fifth member of the Fago team. He was up the front early on today, but now he is, in fact, uh, losing contact with this. Now, let's have a look up the road here from the Fagos on the front, panning along uh, by our helicopter. I don't know how he ever finds the riders, uh, quite frankly, but there he is in the distance, and I suppose uh, it's very difficult to assess, but that can't be more than 15 seconds up the road for Aberdeen. He might just survive to take the prize on top of the Cheddar Gorge. He certainly deserves that. He's won all of the climbs today if he does that, and that's been a marvellous day out for him. Well, as you look at him now, Phil, it looks as if he's resigned himself slightly to being caught because he's, uh, he's just turning the gear off. He's not fighting the gear as he was before when we were watching him. He's just turning the gears over to try and stay away and get that mountains prize at the top here. Well, if this is just turning the gears over, Paul, it really looks to me as though he's going through all sorts of pain barriers at the moment. Out uh, now, away from the Cheddar Gorge, the lights behind Aberdeen, I'm afraid, are saying it's not much longer for him now. The rain is almost off, but the roads are extremely damp. And this has been quite a bad day of rain today, in fact. The green flag you may have just caught a glimpse of. 200 metres to go to the prize at the top of the gorge. 
their big field are now at the green flag while Aberdeen is just about going to hit the white one and that will give him a lead of about 150 yards over the main field so Aberdeen Paul I don't think now uh, can stay away all the way to Bristol. Well, I think they're going to catch Aberdeen in uh, the next few moments as we watch here. And now is the time that if Joey McLaughlin is going to, now is the time he's got to launch this attack. Unless, if he can't do it now, he has one last chance, and that's on the finishing circuit. As I'm looking now down at the result, Aberdeen is there, Gianetti is second place, so it looks as if he's definitely going to take this King of the Mountains competition. Sean Kelly quite clearly deciding today he was not going to participate. Stephen Hodge has put in a challenge, and I think he may well have done enough now to climb over teammate Kelly into second place overall. No doubt then, Gianetti, the king of the mountains today, and it's the end too here now for Henri Abadi. Certainly our hero today. I put him down as the best break of the whole race so far. He took them on, he took the yellow jersey for a while. He's lost it now because there's Malcolm Elliott on his shoulder. He looks across at the wheel there of Giannetti. There's Giannetti, now the winner-elect of the King of the Mountains competition. No more hills left of note in this race. A couple on the finishing circuit in Bristol, and he won't worry about those. Elliott now thinking, too, that maybe that yellow jersey is safe, at least for today, and the big battle will be in Westminster tomorrow. Well, the pressure again very, very much on, Paul. That's a long, thin line down there. The wind uh, coming from the right of the riders, pinning them in the left-hand corner. And as we look down here, what a trio of riders. We've got uh, Malcolm Miller, who's just gone there, Joey McLaughlin, followed by Sean Kelly, and just on his wheel, Stephen Roach. And look at the face on Joey McLaughlin. It's not the face of Joey's big days, and maybe the lack of, uh, the lack of races that he's had this year with all his problems has uh, put him a little bit behind Malcolm Elliott, who's come out of the Tour de France with a little bit more strength in his legs. Absolutely, and that's great credit to Joey McLaughlin, who came to this race from injury and has responded so well as the defending champion that he's still very much in with a chance of snatching this event. And coming to the front, look at this. This is, uh, this is Sean Yates. He's the man who's done everything that he can today for, uh, for Malcolm Elliott. But look at the face on him. That's not the face of Sean. That's what Sean would say is a full mask. So Sean Yates then uh, selling, his, uh, selling himself here uh, for his teammate Malcolm Elliott. And now we've got the descents to come. And it looks to me as though we have a problem here. It looks like the team manager there. The team manager of the ADR team, or the Isoglass team in fact, is in trouble and one or two riders we understand have fallen at the head of the field four riders have gone down no serious injury as far as we know but that is jean eric Ostergaard, who seems to be the worst delayed everybody else however on the way as stephen roach and malcolm elliott and co are still in this group bristol is now on the horizon who's going to win the stage today come back soon The grey, damp weather has not abated as we welcome you back to the culmination of day five of the Tour of Britain to the city of Bristol. The big crowds in the city here will be a warm sight to the riders after their punishing 151-mile stage. We saw an accident earlier on at the gorge. Fortunately, nothing too serious. Most of the riders back up on their feet and on the bikes. So, three times around this circuit, the time's now of crucial importance to the overall result. So, let's rejoin Phil Liggett. And the riders now rushing into the city of Bristol, yet another city on this rapid tour of Britain. Adrian Timmis on the front here, the rider who tried so hard to win in Birmingham yesterday, and he managed a very, very good fourth place. Now he's bringing the Z Peugeot team onto the circuit, and still in this group, Joey McLaughlin in the green jersey. These are the riders who've come together, regrouped after that crash, coming away from the Mendip Hills. Well, Phil, it's still the Z Peugeot team trying to break the stranglehold that Malcolm Elliott has had on this race since the start. And there they are, Adrian Timmis going through with Ronan Ponsek in second place there. It's, the, it's a really hard circuit around here in Bristol with that little climb up Park Street and Queen Street. And this is where, if Joey's going to try and uh, take it away from Malcolm, that's where the attacks have got to come. And again, a marvellous city centre crowd, despite the atrocious conditions today. It's been very cold, very wet, and Robert Miller has been finding it very painful too. There he is, on the far right of the picture, the green jersey of Joey McLaughlin, the points leader in this race, 
climbing the hill here and McLaughlin hasn't yet managed to break the iron grip of the Fagor team. He started the day just 19 seconds adrift of Malcolm Elliott. Remember, Elliott, right at the beginning of the day, won that three-second time bonus at Henley. So it now means, of course, he leads overall by 22 seconds. And there is uh, Sean Yates moving up there into second place. Sean has been an incredible rider in this year's Tour of Britain. He's at the moment third overall in this tour, and he hasn't even thought about his own overall placing because all he's thinking about is the team effort. Adrian Timmis on the front there for Zed Peugeot, trying to keep the pace up so that one or two of these riders can try and attack and break away because everybody's so close together at the moment. Well, the Peugeot team was certainly the most outstanding French team in this year's Tour de France. They rode it so well. As they're on now, two laps to go to the finish. It's quite a long circuit here in the city of Bristol and one of the nicest too because it's very, very hard indeed, especially with this climb on every circuit. The red jersey there of Rob Holden, who still survives. Well, survives really isn't the word. He's running away with the under-23 competition at this minute and, of course, he's the youngest man at 20. And look at the leg there of Keith Reynolds. He's one of the fallers out on the course earlier and he's now coming through the finish, detached by something like... Uh, three or four minutes. Well, it's been an incredible tour by Keith Reynolds because he's really come to his own in this tour and he's showing the, uh, showing the class that he's already showed last year in his first year as a professional. He's also showing the courage now, Paul, because up in the action at Stoke-on-Trent, where he was third, he's now having to limp in a long way behind the field. Maddio here attacking with determination on the climb and leaving Sean Yates and the rest of them. The big crowd stretching right the way up this hill. It really is a difficult sprint on the climb. Well, this is a good place for Mark Maggio to attack as well because he's won a lot of races in his professional career by going away in the last five, six kilometres. And as he goes away over the climb here, it's going to put a lot of pressure on the rest of the riders. But it looks as if he gets to the top here as if he's easing up a little bit, although <laughs> I'm saying that it's very, very hard over the top of this climb. But Maggio himself is only about 45 seconds down on Malcolm Elliott. There are so many riders can still win this race. There's not more attacks now. Madio has gone back into the group here, but it's the cast riders on the attack now. And is this Stephen Hodge? And yes, indeed it is. So Hodge now trying. He's moved up, by the way, to second overall in the King of the Mountains. He's jumped over Sean Kelly. Gianetti, of course, now confirmed in that competition. And it's going to get harder and harder on this circuit now for the uh, Fagor team to chase because they've been chasing all day. The Zed Peugeot sent that break away with Alba D. And now you see it's the Zed Peugeot team actually taking up the racing. And it's... Fortunately, this is a lucky move for the Fagor team because they must be very, very tired because Sean Yates, for instance, there has probably been on the front for something like 100 miles of this 151-mile stage. Well, the Fagors, we keep talking about them. They've been the team of the race and certainly the team of today. They've kept this race together for Malcolm Elliott. There's a 10 seconds time bonus for the winner today. The first four riders receive bonuses. And with Elliott leading by just those 22 seconds, of course, a 10-second slice off the top for McLaughlin today. There he is in that green jersey in third place. Would set him up nicely when we go to Westminster tomorrow for the big finale. And that is probably why it's the Zed Peugeot riders here now trying to keep this race together in the hope that McLaughlin in third place there will come up with the goods in the sprint. And there's McLaughlin there, as you said, in third place, but he's always being shadowed by Malcolm Elliott. Malcolm is feeling real as if he's only got one man to watch in this race. Uh, short, Stephen Roach is back a little bit as they come through with the bell with one lap to go. This is the time when if any attacks are going to come, they'll come on this lap now on the climb. Ronan Pensek on the front then for Joey McLaughlin now. Pensek's chances went at Stoke-on-Trent when his bike frame snapped. He lost then over 10 minutes and all hope of victory. That man was seventh in the Tour de France. Now he's keeping this race hopefully together, keeping the speed high, so that Joey McLaughlin can come out of the bottom corner there and try and do what he did so successfully in Liverpool, and that's beat Malcolm Elliott. Well, as they come up the climb here, you can see Sean Yates moving up to keep the pace high because he knows what the danger is. He wants to make sure that the pace is just that little bit too high for Joy McLaughlin, who's moved into second place. But Yates is keeping the pace so high, he's actually riding away from the field. Just look at this man, Sean Yates. He's ripping away from McLaughlin. McLaughlin recovering a little bit now to try and get back into the race, but he's having to fight very hard. This is going to hurt Joey McLaughlin. This is going to take a little bit of the sting out of his tail because these riders today, you know, 
if you count the 10 miles that they did to the race start proper today, have ridden over 160 miles and been in the saddle for over eight hours. And still they're going with all the strength that they go at the end of every stage. And still it's Sean Yates who we see at the front. Look at that face, Paul. Yates really giving it. Hey, unbelievable the way Sean's ridden. But that kind of move that he's just done there is absolutely and utterly demoralising for the rest because Sean is riding here as a teammate when really he's as strong as any of the leaders and that must be a blow to Joey McLaughlin's morale when he went up that climb there. And look at the face on Joey here. This is really a mask on his face today as well. I think today must be the day of the masks. Well... It's rather a cool one there on Malcolm Elliott. He is the big man himself, the animal many people call him. He's such a strong, strong rider. Now it's John Clay here having a dig. In fact, I think it was Darrell Webster who was having a dig there. And it looks to me as though Webster, who you may see the dirt down the side of his jersey there, he was on the floor in that crash in the men dips uh, just a few moments ago. But Yates having none of it brings this race back. The, if there was a vote on the man of the race over this week, Sean Yates would certainly take that the most aggressive rider, the man who's holding the defence all the time. And now this looks like Thomas Wegmuller trying as he tries to go for home. We're inside the final kilometre here. Wegmuller has put in an attack. He's a rider that everybody's spoken about all day, expecting something. They really thought that Wegmuller was going to be the man today to go ahead all the way across the Cotswolds and the Mendips, and it wasn't. But now he's going now before the crowd. Thomas Wegmuller from Switzerland, the rider who lost Paddy Roubaix this year, the greatest classic in the world because of a plastic bag in his back wheel. He's going to win this one. Thomas Wegmuller has jumped clear now. Wegmuller takes the victory on the line. I'm not surprised. He's delighted. Three wins last year. That's the first win of the year for him and he's absolutely delighted and we'll have a look at that again Thomas Wegmuller then wins the sprint this is how he did it he jumped away in the last kilometre of the stage and he was the man with the most strength left in those legs after 151 miles today so Sean Kelly's uh, Cass Sport Life team are going clear at last with a victory they've been searching for and full of determination Paul as he drives it home towards the line and uh, the second and third place is also taken by the cast team with Jean Manfrain. There's the confirmation. And Sean Kelly himself in third. Gayon fourth. Elliot was fifth. And Frank Hoster from Belgium was sixth. Malcolm Elliot then still keeps himself on top thanks to the efforts of men like Stephen Roach. Malcolm, the end of a very punishing day's racing for you. Long and hard and very wet weather. Yeah, it's been a, an extremely long day. And uh, I want to say thanks... Well, I don't really know quite how to say thanks to the, uh, to the extent to, uh, to, to my teammates uh, for the, uh, the enormous amount of work they've done over these last few days. And uh, today, 150 miles, they've been on the front for most of that. And uh, they've just gone on day after day after day like robots. And, but you uh, yourself made a very positive move at Henley and Arden winning that sprint. Yeah, it wasn't one of those things. It wasn't planned in any way. It uh, just came about uh, Steve Jones a tight and uh, I think uh, I seem to remember another rider who was slightly dangerous went with him so uh, I, I had to go too to, just to cover the move and we finished up with a bit of a split and we saw the one mile to go to the TV time sprint and uh, I thought well we'll just drive it until we get past the sprint and uh, I'll take uh, three more seconds which would you know make me slightly more comfortable. The Peugeot team tried to break you there with that breakaway, but as you say, your team stuck by and pulled you through. Yeah, we, uh, we, the temptation was to panic a little. Uh, it was going very, very strongly and uh, it looked quite good, but when you imagine the, the fact that there was, uh, I think, a good 100 miles, um, a, yeah, about 100 miles to go before, uh, before the finish, and the wind was in, it was, uh, it was a headwind, and... Uh, in spite of him riding hard, we just kept our cool, rode, well, I say steady, but uh, you're riding on the front for all that time, it, just, it really, really does take its toll on the lads. Uh, but uh, he, he eventually, you know, because he was on his own out front there, it just becomes too much, and uh, we caught him just at the top of Teddy Gorge. Malcolm, you said yesterday that whoever won today, or whoever would retain the yellow jersey today, you reckon would win the Tour? I think that's, uh, I think that's a strong possibility now. I mean, I'm saying... We're going into tomorrow, and uh, I don't see myself losing it. But for bad luck or crash or puncture and uh, at, the, at the wrong time, you know. Malcolm, thanks very much. Have a good rest tonight. Thanks. I will. So at last, Malcolm Elliott speaks with confidence. The man who should have attacked, uh, still in the green jersey, 
Joey McLaughlin, but only just because, in fact, they're equal on top in the points competition with 76 points each. But it's Elliot who gets the champagne again. And there is the overall situation. Malcolm Elliott leads McLaughlin by 22, Wedmuller third, Sean Yates fourth, Kelly fifth. And the man who won today is Giannetti. He's the king of the mountains now. 104 points from Hodge and Kelly. So, after an exciting day, a ride of almost eight hours, 13 riders have once again proved totally inseparable in this Kellogg's Tour of Britain. I would have thought that tonight we would have known the destination of this £10,000 Citroën car going to the winner of the race. We certainly don't know that. And tomorrow, the race on the streets of Westminster in London will decide the result of this event. Malcolm Elliott now goes to London in yellow, just as he left Newcastle-upon-Tyne almost a week ago last Tuesday. Joey McLaughlin still the challenger in second place. Stephen Roach occupies fifth spot now. And Thomas Wegmuller has come back in as a real challenger. This race still wide open. On the streets of London tomorrow, the decisions will be made. So, until then, good night. Bicycle.